It is unfortunate that many people and Christians will have spent a large part of their lives climbing the ladder of success only to discover at the end that it was leaning against the wrong wall. In an effort to meet the standards of our world system and what it calls success, many will have missed the purposes of God. They will have perhaps been very great in their careers and in their education and with their resources, but will stand before God never having finished the work that God had called them to do. What we call purpose or destiny, your divinely designed reason for being once you become a Christian. The reason why we were not raptured at the moment of conversion was that God left us here for the achievement and the accomplishment of a kingdom purpose. Unfortunately today, it is easy to get caught up in the wrong purpose. The purposes of people, possessions, paychecks, power, popularity, and maybe we sprinkle a little piety in to make us feel a little better. It is easy to live the life that we live without the right end game in mind. Like the man who said, I was dying to finish high school so that I could go to college. I was dying to finish college so that I could start my career. I was dying to get married so that I could start a family. I was dying for those kids to become 18 so that they could leave. <laughs> I was dying to retire only to discover now I'm just dying. And the sense of purpose is gone. That leads us to our two chapters today, chapters three and four of the book of Esther. Because it is in these chapters that the greatest statement and the most famous statement in the book is located in chapter four, verse 14, when Mordecai asked her the question, have you not attained royalty for such a time as this? Or as the King James says, have you not been called to the kingdom? for such a time as this. So I want to explain to you using the providential hand of God in the life of Esther, how you know when it's your time. You hear people talk about, it's my time, it's my season. And that's easy to say and quote, but how do you know when God has prepared you for the moment? That time that he has worked with you for through the good, the bad, and the ugly to bring you to a space of usefulness for his kingdom purposes. Well, chapter four opens up with a problem because we're told in, cha excuse me, chapter three opens up with a problem because we're told in chapter three, verse one, after these events, King Yahazuerus promotes Haman, the son of Hamidiatha, the Agagite, and advanced him and established his authority over the princesses who were with him. And all the king's servants who were at the king's gate bowed down and paid homage to Haman. But Mordecai neither bowed nor did he pay homage. Houston, we have a problem. Ahasuerus, the king, has decided to elevate a man named Haman. Haman is made the second most powerful person in the Medo-Persian Empire. And the king has said, I want there to be public recognition of the promotion that I've given to Haman, so I want everybody in the kingdom to bow. And so as everybody began to bow, then they came to one of the employees of the king named Mordecai. And they said, Mordecai, it's time to bow. Mr. Haman is coming down. Mr. Haman is passing through. Mordecai says, uh, um, excuse me, but I can't do that. I can't bow and pay homage. I cannot worship him. I can respect him. I can, uh, uh, you know, affirm him. But what you're asking me to do is bow down and pay homage. You're calling for an act of worship, and I can't do that. So Mordecai refuses. Houston, we have a problem. They want to know, verse 3, how are you transgressing the king's command? Let me put it in everyday language. 
How you not doing what the government told you to do? Because this is the king talking. This is governmental affairs. And they say, look, this is the government. We expect you to obey the government. Well, obeying the government is one thing. Worshiping and bowing to it, that's a whole other ball game. And Mordecai says, I can't do that. They spoke to him daily according to verse 4. <laughs> they told Haman, there's this dude named Mordecai, and he's not going to bow, but let me tell you why he's not going to bow. He's a Jew. And them people over there, they've been taught by you know, their worldview that you do not bow, that is, in worship to men or to systems of men, governments, when they conflict with their belief system. And so this Mordecai is not going to bow. Hmm. Haman, verse 5, was full of rage, ticked off. He said, well, not only am I going to kill, verse 6, verse 6, not only am I going to kill Mordecai, I'm going to kill all of his people. I'm going to do genocide against the Jews because I know all them people think like he think. So we're not going to have that, not under my rule. King Ahasuerus has given me clout and I'm not going to have anybody around here not recognizing my authority. So he's gone and everybody like him is gone. We're going to get rid of the Jews. He brings the idea to the king, Ahasuerus. And he tells Ahasuerus, Mr. Ahasuerus, king, you got some people here who don't go with you. There's a certain people scattered and they don't abide by your rules. They don't abide by your laws. Verse 8. And so, he says, so king, we got to do something about these folk. So if it pleases the king, verse 9, what I want to do is I want to get rid of them. I want to exterminate them because they're going to be a headache for you. In fact, I want to get rid of these people so bad, verse 9, that I will pay you to help get rid of them 10,000 talents of silver. I'm going to give you a boatload of money just to get rid of these people because these people are nothing but trouble because they're not going to bow. They're not going to submit to the government. They're not going to submit to the authority. So the king put his signet ring down, signed the law of Haman, the Agagite. Let me pause. We're told a couple of times in this passage Haman's background. He's an Agagite. Now that may not mean much to you, but God doesn't waste words in his word. This has a history to it. You see, the Agagites came from Agag. Agag is found in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verses 1 to 23. Agag is head of the Amalekites, and the Amalekites were trying to destroy the Jews many years ago when Saul was king in 1 Samuel 15. God told Saul, I want you to go, and I want you to to destroy the Amalekites and I want you to destroy the King Agag because these folks are trying to kill you. But Saul thought he was too smart for God and he decided I'm not going to kill the king, I'm going to kill some of the stuff but I'm not going to kill all of the stuff because we can use some of the stuff. So he disobeyed God, Agag was allowed to live longer so his legacy was allowed to continue. So now we in Esther with the fruit of a root of a same problem that wasn't dealt with early. So some of us know what it is to have something we should have dealt with, wish we would have dealt with, and if we would have dealt with it, we wouldn't be dealing with this today. But because we didn't deal with it, when we should have dealt with it, we wind up with the fruit of it continuing in our life and circumstance. So when it says that Haman was an agite, he's telling you he's part of a legacy of unaddressed sin, of unaddressed fully do dealing with something God told you to deal with long ago that you're now having to deal with the repercussions of. And so now, not only is Mordecai in trouble, the whole race of Jews is about to be exterminated. Okay, here's lesson number one. You know it's your time. You know it's your time when God connects spiritual preparation 
with spiritual warfare. You see, Haman was an agent of the devil whose goal it is to thwart the purposes of God. In the Old Testament, it had to do with destroying the Jews. In the New Testament, it has to do with muting the effectiveness of the church. The people, representative people of God. And so in order to pull that off, Satan uses people and uses systems in order to destroy the program and promises and purposes of God. God had said, I'm going to build this people, protect this people. They are going to be my people because the Messiah is going to come through the Jews. And so all along the way, there's a theology of genocide and destruction trying to hinder the purposes of God. Whenever God is getting ready to use someone, they will have a battle to overcome. They will have spiritual warfare that will seek to destroy God's program and purpose in your life and in the life of others. Because as you'll see, it's not just about you. He's going to get rid of Mordecai and all of the Jews. Before David could be recognized to be the future king of Israel, he had to go through a battle first. He had to face Goliath. It wasn't until he defeated Goliath, spiritual warfare, since it was a battle between gods, that he began to emerge as preparation for kingship. But before God elevated him to ultimate purpose, he had to use him in spiritual battle. So spiritual battle is always a prerequisite to spiritual purpose. If you're not willing to demonstrate that you're willing to deal with the spiritual issues that Satan brings in your life to thwart your purpose and how God wants to use you for the benefit of others, then you're not ready to be realized and set free for your ultimate spiritual purpose. See, what God wants to know before he gives you spiritual responsibility is that he can trust you to use the spiritual when the going gets tough. He wants to know that the spiritual won't be thrown aside when the natural shows up. Because it's real easy when the natural shows up to get natural. It's easy when the natural shows up to go secular. But when the spiritual shows up because there is a spiritual issue of thwarting the program of God, the question is, do you have insight enough to see what's happening spiritually so that you have foretaste enough to address it spiritually? So when God is going to give you your time, that is, the time to be released to your ultimate purpose, there will be a spiritual battle that you will have to not only fight, but that you will have to make your declaration known. And so now the Jews are about to be destroyed. The scribes in verse 12 send the word out. The edict goes out about the destruction of the Jews. Letters are sent in verse 13 by carriers to all the provinces to destroy, to kill, and annihilate all the Jews, young, old, women, children. But we're told that this happened, was going to happen in a 12-month cycle. You see that in verse 7. You see that in verse 13. It says the 12th month. Let me just throw this in. If you look at verse 7, it says per, p u r -a, that is the lot, the lot. The lot is dice, okay? Y'all know dice, right? <laughs> Come on, don't act like y'all don't know dice. So Haman is shaking the dice to determine when he's going to destroy them. They came up six and six, 12th month. So the dice got rolled. It didn't come up with two zeros. It didn't come up with one and one. It came up with six and six because it's 12 months. You see, even when Satan rolls the dice, God loads them. Because God is so sovereign and providential, he controls the dice. So there is a 12-month window between the time of the declaration and the time of the execution. Whenever God creates a gap, when evil is about to occur, the gap is good news in a bad situation. Remember he told Nineveh through Jonah in 40 days, Nineveh would be destroyed. 
Why not just destroy them? Because there's a window. There's a window between judgment declared and judgment implemented. Whenever God creates a window, you better praise him. Because a window is an opportunity. It's called a grace window. It's a window where God's mercy and grace is still being allowed before destruction is implemented. So there is a 12-month window because God loaded the dice, gave them the maximum amount of months within a year to address the problem of satanic influence to bring about a destruction in God's people and on behalf of God's program. And so the saga continues of the providential hand of God. The edict is given. And when the edict is given, chapter 4, verse 1, when Mordecai learned that all of all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, the garments of sorrow, and went out into the midst of the city and walked loudly and wailed loudly and bitterly. You could hear that man crying all over the place. Because when Satan is trying to do a number on you, he can bring you to tears. Many of us know what it is to have a, a spiritual warfare against us and we're weeping and wailing because the pain is so deep and so great. He was out there loudly declaring uh, a hopelessness because of how bad things look. He went as far as the king's gate. That's the entrance to the king's palace. And no one was to enter the king's, king's gate clothed in sackcloth. But there he was, mourning, with great mourning. Because we're told in verse 15 there was great confusion. You think you're a Jewish father sitting there with your family and you hear come across the evening news, all Jews are to be exterminated. There's panic in the city of Susan. And now everybody's wailing because it looks like a hopeless situation. Let me tell you something, never count God out. No matter how bad things look. Well, Esther finds out that her cousin is out there in sackcloth and ashes. She doesn't really know what's going on. And so she sends him clothes out there to get him dressed. He rejects the clothes. And so it now gets real interesting. She sends her servant, Hathbath, out in verse 6 to Mordecai. And Mordecai told him all that had happened to him the exact amount of money that Haman had promised to pay to the king's treasury for the destruction of the Jews. He sends word back to Esther. Gave a copy of the edict, and this is what he says to her in verse 8. That he might show Esther and inform her and to order her to go to the king and employ his favor and to plead with him for her people. Mordecai tells, says to Esther's servant, take the, edict to Mordecai, to, take the edict to Esther and tell Esther now to go to the king and tell him who you are. Remember, I told you don't tell him when, you first, when he first brought you in. Don't tell him because there's an anti-Semitic atmosphere in this city. So you don't tell him. But girlfriend, honey bun, cuz, <laughs> it's now time to come out the closet. It's now time to go public. It's now time to let it be known who you are and who your people happen to be. It's time. You know it's time for God to move you to your ultimate purpose. When he has given you a position that leverages influence for the advancement of his kingdom. He says, girl, you're not just here because you're pretty. You're pretty, but that's not why you're here. You're here because when you were pretty and didn't know what was going on, God knew this day was going to come. He doesn't use the name God, but it will be clear in a moment that's his frame of reference. God knew that this day was going to come. It's time. You've been set up for a situation. When God has positioned you to leverage influence for his kingdom purposes. Let me put it another way. When your position in life allows you to leverage influence for the advancement of God's program and God's people.
people. To put it another way, when he has blessed you to be a blessing. See, we got a problem today. We got a misunderstanding of blessing. We got people running around here, I'm looking for my blessing. Okay? That is a flawed approach to blessing because it's incomplete. Whenever you tell God, I want my blessing, period, you have prostituted the term because blessing is only blessing in the Bible when it can flow through you and not just to you. God told Abraham, I'm going to bless you and through you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. So whenever you go to God for a blessing, let him know that if he blesses to you, how it's going to flow through you so it can be a blessing to somebody else. God just doesn't move you out of South Dallas to North Dallas. He just doesn't get you out of a bicycle and move you to a Benz. He just doesn't keep you out of the, the Salvation Army thrift shop just so now that you can go to the most fabulous malls just so you can live large. He always wants to know how you're going to use the gifts, talents, skills, and resources he has given you to advance his kingdom program. And if there is little or no concern for his kingdom, you just cut off your blessing. In fact, you will watch your blessing become a curse because you're not using it for kingdom purposes as well as personal benefit. So he tells her, it's time. It's time for you to use your position, your influence, your resources, and you are now to leverage that in light of the spiritual issue. The problem is, if you don't see the spiritual, you don't see the opportunity. See, if all you're looking at is the physical, then you don't see what's happening behind the scenes in the spiritual. So, so you, you, you all shook up about what's happening in the physical because you don't know that there is a spiritual activity occurring behind the scenes. So, she hears that she's supposed to go before the king. So she sends word back to Mort. Mort, verse 11. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that for any man or woman who comes to the king, to the inner court, who is not summoned, he has but one law that he be put to death. Unless the king holds out to him the golden scepter so that he may live, and I have not been summoned to come to the king for these 30 days. Mort, let me explain something. I need you to understand, cuz. It's sort of like this. Me and the king have not been talking for 30 days. 30 days, we, we not, you know, we on the outs with each other. He had not wanted me in his bedchamber. He's not talking to me. Because between chapter 2 and chapter 3 is five years. Because you know after five years, the marriage can go south. So it's five-year marriage, and he's not all that impressed with her beauty anymore. Maybe she didn't pick up a few wrinkles in five years. I don't know. But whatever it was, for 30 days, he's not talking to sister. He's not talking to his wife. He's not talking to her. And he says, there's rule in this house. If you go in the king uninvited, and he does not hold out that royal scepter, it's over. It's over. You are put to death. So what you're asking, Mort, is for me to risk my career, life, economic stability, my crib. I'm living in the palace. You, you're asking me to put that on the line for y'all. See, you're no longer us. See, she a Jew too, but she ain't like them Jews back there. She ain't like them Jews still caught in a bad situation. She's not like those Jews who still live in 
in shabby houses. She's not like them Jews who still have to eke out a life with minimum income. She's not like those Jews who still have to catch the bus. She's not like those Jews who don't have multiple changes of clothes. She's not like those Jews who are still living in inferior housing with inferior education, with inferior opportunity. She's not like those Jews. I used to be one of y'all. But I'm up here now. Now, I'm a Jew, but I'm a different Jew. I'm an upper class Jew. I'm a, I'm a Sadidi Jew. I'm a successful Jew. I'm a Jew with a bank account. I'm a Jew with a CD. I'm a, I'm a Jew, well, that don't mean nothing now. I'm a Jew with <laughs> stocks and bonds. And I'm, I'm a, I am a successful Jew. Now, I know what it's like because I used to live with y'all. But, but, but my situation is different now. I, so I pray for you. I hope it works out. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm in a different socioeconomic political scenario. And if I go into my husband's room and he has not invited me and he does not hold out the scepter, uh, I'm not willing to do that for y'all because I used to be a Jew now I'm Jew plus <laughs> what she did is what we do we misdiagnose kingdom opportunity because we don't see it all we see is this could have a negative effect on me see she forgot something if it wasn't for the goodness of God, she wouldn't be there. See, she, she missed that. She missed, along the way, she misunderstood. If it wasn't for the goodness of God, girl, you did not get here on your own. You got here the same way a turtle gets to the top of a fence. Somebody put it there. So she forgot all that, and having forgotten all that, she... She said, look, this is about me now. Not about y'all, it's about me. Y'all get it like I got it. Because right now it's about me and I can't put myself in that position. She forgot and it's easy to forget how you got where you are. It's easy to forget. Once you start living in a certain neighborhood and driving a certain vehicle and wearing certain clothes and getting a, a BA and an MBA and a doctorate and it's easy to forget that if it were not for the grace of God, you would not be in the position you are now in. It's easy to forget that. And when you forget that, you're not so concerned about how other folk gonna make it. You wind up saying like her, in essence, I made it, why y'all not making it? You become, we become self-absorbed. See, I'm clearly understand that I am not supposed to be here. I am not supposed to be on the street in this pulpit doing this. When I was raised in, in a, my father was not a believer in those early years and my home was in total disarray, I'm not supposed to be here. But because God invaded my home and led my father to Christ, changing his life, bringing God into our family, taking me to a Bible teaching church, allowing me to have unique opportunities. See, I clearly understand the only reason I'm standing here today is the goodness and grace of God. So the moment I lose sight of that, the moment I lose sight that what Paul said, I am what I am only by the grace of God. That's the only reason that I am. The moment I lose sight of that, my role has now been illegitimized because God did not allow me the experiences and opportunities that he's allowed me to make it all and only about me. And anybody who does that must be held to account that it is not just about me or you or even us. It's about the kingdom of God. And when we lose sight of that, 
then we've missed God's plan and program in history. Deuteronomy 8.18, uh, Moses said, God has given you the power to make wealth to fulfill his covenant. It's about a kingdom purpose. It's okay to benefit from a kingdom purpose as long as you don't lose the kingdom purpose in the process of benefiting. Because when you do that, you lose your destiny. You see, your destiny will always involve a test whether you want to be a blessing or whether you only want to be blessed. Because once you hit that test, God now examines your heart. Are you here for him? Are you here for how he can use you for others? Or is this just about you, me? Is this just about selfishness? And so she says, I can't help y'all. Tony Dungy, the famed coach for the Indianapolis Colts. During the year that he won the Super Bowl, we talked on the phone when he got to the playoffs. So we'd get on the phone and, uh, Coach, what you want to pray about today? He says, oh, my prayer is simple. That win or lose, that I might make his name great before this national audience. We finally get to the Super Bowl when the Indianapolis Colts are going to play the Chicago Bears. Coach, what's your prayer? He says, the world is watching. Win or lose, I want to make it inextricably clear I belong to Jesus Christ. I do not want to miss this moment for an opportunity for my witness. What's my point? He had a kingdom connection to football because that was his time. Your value to the kingdom of God is your usefulness. Sand on a beach is free. You go on a beach, you walk around the beach, sand is free. That same sand, if you want to put it in a playground, is going to cost you. You got to go to the store and buy bags of sand. And that same free stuff. You got to now pay for it to put it on a playground because it's used differently. Yeah. If you want sandpaper, all that is is sand glue on paper. <laughs> but you got to go to Lowe's or Home Depot or someplace and you got to go buy sandpaper. It's that same free sand with a little bit of glue and some paper not costing you. And don't go to Silicon Valley because they make computer chips with sand. That's the most expensive sand you ever saw in your life. Not because it's different, it's used differently. See, one of the reasons why God can't do much with, one of one, with his people is he can't use them, so they're just sand. They're just out there. Because he can't, he can't find enough Silicon Valley saints. Saints whose value is tied to their usefulness. What good is a refrigerator that doesn't work? A stove that won't light up. A can opener that won't come on. And a toaster that won't pop up bread. No matter how expensive it was, no matter how good it looks, if it does not do what it was created to do, it's useless appliance. God says about his people in Luke 14, he says some of his salt, some of his believers are useless. He calls us useless because we have no kingdom orientation and we wind up saying, I don't know what my purpose is. And you'll never find it if you're not kingdom oriented. You'll never find your time because it's only about you, not through you, only to you. So your time comes when you discover how God can use you to be a blessing. You know, department stores, department stores, big department stores have display windows, and then those display windows are dummies. Dummies. Okay, let's, let's get sophisticated. Mannequins. <laughs> Mannequins. But basically, dummies. In the real expensive stores, they put up living large dummies. These are dummies. I've seen dummies with tucks. The women wearing gowns, Rolex watches. 
in New York one time, I saw a window with a dummy sitting in a Ferrari. In the window. Why do the owners of the department stores put dummies in the window? Because they know they're dummies like us walking up the street. <laughs> so you know what they do? They put them on display. The reason they put the mannequins or the dummies on display is so that when the other dummies are walking up the street, they will be impressed by what's on display. And having been impressed by what's on display, it will draw them into the store so that they can get some stuff for themselves. In other words, the dummy isn't put on display to show off the dummy. Dummy. The dummy is put on display to be an attraction to a bigger kingdom. To draw people off the street into the kingdom where there's floor after floor after floor after floor of so much more. When God blesses you, he's putting you on display. He allows you to be successful. He allows you to get an education. He allows you to have resources so that so it allows you some popularity and some notoriety. He is now putting you on display so that as a representative of his kingdom, other people will see what a dummy looks like who's been touched by the grace of God. But don't forget on your best day, you still a... There you go. Because on our best day, we're sinners saved by grace. The Titanic was a, was a terrible, terrible uh, incident in 19, 1912, sinking. 1,500 people lost their lives. 1,500 people lost their lives in the maiden voyage of the sinking of the Titanic. But did you know 1,500 people didn't have to die? 1,500 people shouldn't have died. Did you know that most of the lifeboats coming off of the Titanic were half filled? Only half filled. But the people who were saved and delivered didn't want to risk turning back. Because if they turned back, the people drowning might bum rush the boat. And if everybody bum rushed the boat, it might flip the boat over. So since they had been saved and delivered. They didn't want to risk going back to save and deliver others because it might interfere with their being saved and delivered. So 1,500 people died because other people who were already saved didn't want to save others. If you've been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, God has not just left you here because you're making it to glory. He's left you here because there are folk drowning all around you, drowning spiritually, drowning relationally, drowning morally, drowning. They're just drowning. And here we are in this OCBF lifeboat, your personal lifeboat. It can't only be about you or me or even us in our church. We do not exist only for ourselves. We exist to make a difference and impact. You know, bowlers are known for their impact. I don't care how good looking bowler you are. You know, because there's a bowler, you know, today you know, bowl, you bowl fancy today. When I was growing up, it wasn't fancy bowling. Today it's fancy bowling. They got bowling pants, bowling shirts, bowling gloves, you know, bowling socks. You know, they got, and, it, and then the fancy bowling bags and fancier bowling balls. And then there's the bowling style. Put your three fingers in, cock the ball. No matter how good you look as a bowler, if the pins are still standing, <laughs> you have failed. Because a bowler is measured by his impact. No matter how Christian-y you look, how churchified you act, if there is no impact for the kingdom of God for your life, you are a failed representative. I am a failed representative of the kingdom of God. 
And until God sees that he can use you to knock down some pins, why would he share his purpose with you for you to dismiss it? No, you're blessed to be a blessing and when he sees that. So Mordecai gets this information from her and Mordecai writes her back because you know, by two or three witnesses. He says, no, we, we got to have a second conversation. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther. Because, do not imagine, verse 13, that you in the king's palace can escape any more than all the Jews. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. And you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have been attained royalty, called to the kingdom, for such a time as this. He says, uh, cuz, let, let me help you out here. Because you're, you're a little confused. Do you imagine? And one of my favorite temptation songs is just my imagination running away with me. Girl, your imagination is running away with you. Do you imagine? Do you think? Do you have the mistaken idea that this thing revolves around you? Hello. Because uh, I don't want to be confusing here, cuz. Come on. I want to make sure we're we on the same page. Do you think? Because right now your imagination is running away with you. Do you think? that by not doing this, you're going to save you. And all of us are going to be wiped out. So let me shape your theology. If you don't do it, God has a solution elsewhere. I don't know what it is. I don't know where it is. But without using the name God, let me give you some theology because... Nobody is indispensable. Let, let's get this straight. Let's get this straight. I don't care how good you are, how rich you are, how powerful you are, how skilled you are. God never limits himself to one person. Mm -mm. God always has something up his sleeve. He doesn't reveal it until he needs to. But God always has hidden options. See, if you're going downtown Dallas, you're going down 35, and they have an accident on the highway, in case you don't know it, I know most of you know it, if you're stuck on the highway, there are other options, okay? 35 is not your only option, it's just your direct option, because you can get off on Illinois, turn left, go over to Zang, turn right to Jefferson, turn right again, go across the Jefferson Street Bridge, and you're going to be downtown. Or you can turn right on Illinois and go through South Dallas via Fair Park and make it into downtown. You can get to downtown without the direct route. So while God would like to use you, Esther, while God prefers to use you, Esther, while God would rather use you, Esther, let me explain something. If he can't use you, then he will find somebody else. We don't even know who they are. Because God never allows men to box him in. Okay? So why he wants to use you, 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 and me. I, I see, I'm, I'm of no delusion that God can get rid of me and bring somebody better than me here at Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship. And so if I feel that about me, you know how I feel about you. that God always keeps his options open and that nobody is indispensable when it comes to his kingdom purpose. Now, the reason he said that is because God had made a promise. I will preserve the Jews. See, he had enough of God's word. God's word is not mentioned. God is not mentioned. But, but he knows enough to know that if you don't do it, God's sovereignty will make sure it's done because God is true to his word. And his word can be banked on and depended upon. He would rather use you. But he doesn't have to. So stop smelling yourself. Because you, you ain't all that now. I mean, you, you've been positioned it and God wants to use you. But come on, girl. Come on, girl. 
you, you got to look at this thing differently. In fact, not only will he bring somebody else because he can't use you, he going to mess you up because you were disobedient to your kingdom calling. He, put, he gave you this job. He gave you this position. He gave you this resource. He gave you this education. He gave you this opportunity and you have missed the kingdom purpose. You, no, none of that's being used for the kingdom which involves God's promise for the preservation of his people. The great tragedy today is if our church exists and still doesn't accomplish kingdom purpose. Because just because you're a church doesn't mean you're accomplishing kingdom purpose. That's a name, church. If we're not winning people to Christ, discipling them in the faith, and improving their lives in history so that they can be greater impact vessels for God for eternity, if we're not doing that, demonstrating the kingdom of heaven, visiting the kingdom of earth through kingdom disciples who are heaven's representatives on earth, if we're not doing that, we have a weekly party in the name of Jesus. You've been called to the kingdom for such a time, and the kingdom is bigger than the church. The church is facilitating the kingdom. Well, he hit her with this. Then Esther told them, verse 15 through 17, go assemble all the Jews who are found in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my maidens also will fast in the same way, and thus I will go into the king, which is not according to the law. This, this is risky. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went and did just as Esther had commanded him. Let me tell you how you'll know it's your time. There will be a spiritual conflict that God wants you to intervene on. You will see how he has prepared you to be a blessing, not just be blessed but then he will ask you to take, watch this, a risk of faith. Let me explain something, saints. Faith is risky business because you're dealing with something you can't see. You see, the opposite of faith is sight. If you see it, it's not faith because you, you see it, physically see it. Faith is acting on what you do not see because you believe God wants you to do it based on his word. See, this was based on God keeping a promise. So based on his word, faith is taking a step without being guaranteed the outcome. Okay, watch that now. See, we don't mind taking a step when we can guarantee the outcome. But risky faith, okay, watch this. I'm going to throw this at you. The greater the uncertainty, the greater the purpose. The greater the uncertainty, the more fearful the step. She says, if I perish, I, per I do not know how this is going to work out. And sometimes God causes us when it's our time to take a step and we don't see where that foot's going to land. I don't know if he's going to put out his scepter. I don't know if he's going to keep down his scepter. I do not know how this is going to work out. But because I know this is a kingdom, Mordecai said, you've been called to the kingdom. You've been given a royal opportunity for such a time as this. And because this is now, and you have to take a step. And every time all through the Bible, people have had to take risky steps of faith whenever God was ready to do something big. It's a spiritual entrepreneurialism. Entrepreneurialism is where you take risk. But spiritually, it's where you're acting on God's word based on God's revelation, but without having the, in, uh, without having the results already predetermined, and it could go left. I could perish. But it's clear what I want God to do. So I need spiritual preparation to take this risk. Have y'all fast. Everybody you know fast. Tell your cousins to fast. Your people to fast. Your aunties, your uncles. Tell everybody to fast because I'm, really, I'm going out here on, a, on the line. And I'm going to risk my very well-being for this. And if I perish, I perish. See, the three Hebrew boys had to take a risk. They told Nebuchadnezzar, we're not going to bow. 
Nebuchadnezzar said, then you're going into the fiery furnace. They didn't know that there was going to be a fourth person in there to meet them. They had to take a risky faith because they wouldn't bow in contradiction to the word of God. Daniel had to take a risk. He had to take a risk that when he, he refused to stop praying, when the king's edict said, you can no longer pray in school, you can no longer pray in court, you can no longer do, he took a risk of faith. And he got thrown into the lion's den. He didn't know that the lions would have been fed from manna from above before he got thrown in there and they would lose their appetite for human flesh. Peter had to take a risky step when he stepped out on the water. The only reason he stepped out on the water because Jesus told him he could step out on the water. He steps out on the water and can walk on water, but he didn't know whether he was going to drown before he stepped out. The Israelites crossing the Red Sea, they got... Pharaoh on one hand, the Red Sea on the other hand. They don't know whether that water's going to crash in once they get out into the middle of the ocean. But when you've been called for a purpose, there's going to be a risky step of faith. And that risky step of faith has to take in both options. This could work or it might not. That's God's problem. That's God's problem. I have to trust God if I'm convinced that this is how he's positioned me to use me. I have to trust God and it will always involve benefiting more than you. The Bible says don't just look at yourself but look at the things of others. How will be beneficial to others in the process of me benefiting? It will benefit. You don't want to be like the pilot. The four engines in the plane went out. All four engines in the plane went out. The pilot went and grabbed the one parachute that was on this small plane. He went to the door, unlocked the door. Just before he jumped, he said, don't worry, I'm just going to get some help. <laughs> it was just about him. So the challenge today, I'm challenging you to open your eyes to such a time as this. You know, a turtle only makes progress when it sticks its neck out. Not until it sticks its neck out is it going to move. God wants to use you. God wants to bless you. God wants to empower you because he wants you to make a difference even if it means gambling with faith. That is the risk when you don't know the outcome. I'm challenging you and me and us to another level, the kingdom level. To say, okay, God, with the uncertainty, with me not knowing where all this is going, here I am. Here I am. Use me in whatever way you choose. Use us. Even with the uncertainty, I'll take the risk. I just want you to show me this is the risk you want me to take. Without any promises, I will take the risk of faith. Because I want my time. I don't want to end this time and not have had my time. His name is Thomas Anderson. A.K.A. Neo. His movies are The Matrix, The Matrix Reloaded, and Matrix Revolution. Thomas Anderson is a computer programmer, part-time computer hacker. But Thomas Anderson gets whisked away to a computer-generated reality known as the Matrix. When he gets relocated in this world behind the world that he knows, he discovers behind his world is another world. Behind this other world, he's told that back here in this other world, there are powers that he is <laughs> unaware of. There is a love that he never dreamt of named Trinity. And there are a whole group of people under attack in Zion by the machines. When he's whisked away, he comes to Morpheus. And Morpheus looks at him and says, Neo, we've been waiting for you. You are the one. There's a mass of confusion back here. And we've been waiting to be sent the one. The one who would be used to bring victory and harmony. Now, 
Neil, you need to know, back here there's this dude named Mr. Smith. And Mr. Smith wants to destroy you. Mr. Smith, like Haman, wants to do you in and he wants to destroy Zion and he's going to give everything he can to keep you from fulfilling your purpose as the one. But if you will take the risk and come back here believing that this is your purpose, then while I cannot promise you peace and prosperity and all that, because Mr. Smith is going to reduplicate himself over and over and over again, and he's going to come at you every which way but loose. But if you will accept this assignment, then you can be positioned to save a world in trouble behind the world that you think is the real world. And so, Neil, in this hand I have a blue pill. In this hand, I have a red pill. Neo, you take the blue pill and you'll wake up tomorrow morning in your bed and you'll think you were just in a dream. None of this will be real and you'll go on with your plain old ordinary computer programming life. Or, Neo, if you take the red pill, then you will be given powers that you never dreamt of. You will be given experiences that you never thought of because you will be in the real world. The world behind the world you thought was the real world. So take the blue pill, Neo, and go back home. Take the red pill and let's see how far this rabbit hole goes. Neo looks at both pills. He reaches over to the red pill and he swallows it. Neo Morpheus says, welcome to the real world. So my brothers and sisters, I offer you today two pills. The blue pill, and you go back home today, back to your plain old ordinary life. Yeah, work, raise family, make a little money, pay a little bills. And you go back and you just live your plain old ordinary life and this will just be another Sunday at church. Or, I offer you the red pill. The pill that reflects the precious blood of Jesus Christ. I offer you that red pill. And with that red pill, you leave here and say, I don't want an ordinary life anymore. I don't want to just go through the motions anymore. I do not just want to, to, to go to church anymore. I want my time. And I want to see all that God has for me and all that God wants for me and all that God wants to use me and all that God wants to do through me. Give me the red pill. Don't get me wrong. I'm not promising you if you take the red pill, it's all smooth sailing. Because it's a risky pill to take. I am saying if you take the red pill, we'll get to see how far this rabbit hole goes.